Okay, welcome back from break, everyone. We are rounding the corner to our last uh, panel discussion, and then we'll be opening it up for a group discussion. My name is Michelle Coffey. I'm with the Lambent Foundation, um, and I am uh, moderating an amazing uh, panel, uh, International Cultural Exchange, Mobility, and the Future of U.S. Civil Society. I'm moderating this with my colleague, Barbara, who will also introduce herself. Hi, um, I'm Barbara. I'm the director of the Trust for Mutual Understanding. Um, my job right now as co-moderator is to establish the thesis for this panel. So I'm going to tell you what we're about to talk about and then just hold on to those con concepts in your back pocket and we will continue to uh, re-talk about them. <laughs> so thesis. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview, so uh, general thesis, international cultural exchange, and what we mean by international cultural exchange is um, the international movement of artists and the sharing of ideas. So international cultural exchange is fundament fundamental to a healthy and progressive civil society. It creates nodes of contact between Americans and people from other cultures and promotes understanding, respect, and empathy. And by creating a culture of diversity and respect for different cultures, cultural exchange builds a bulwark against xenophobia, racism, nationalism, authoritarianism, everything that we've been talking about today um, that is uh, upon us in this troubled moment in our history. So unfortunately, at this time when cultural exchange is uh, more important than ever, um, there is a, a crisis. In, uh, not only in funding of international cultural exchange, so over the last decade, financial support for this type of work has been dramatically cut. And what compounds that is, there's also been a massive increase in the costs and the complexity of doing this kind of work. So uh, Michelle and I here are representative of grant makers, funders, who are concerned about promoting civil society everywhere, who are also uh, trying to be thoughtful in our grant making about the intersection of arts and uh, social justice. And we sort of issue a call to our fellow funders um, that we urgently need to prioritize cultural exchange and the international movement of artists. And we encourage other funders to join us. So we actually um, had a panel similar to this at the Grant Makers in the Arts uh, conference, which was in Denver recently. So this is sort of the next iteration of that. Um, just to give you, I know there's maybe some people who like facts and figures in the audience today. Um, so just to give you one uh, fact and figure um, from uh, America, this is a new resource from American for Americans for the Arts. It's called Arts and Social Impact Explorer. And here's the good thing to, to take away uh, fact wise. Nine out of 10 people who participated in arts projects say that their participation in those projects reduces isolation, encourages cooperation, and builds community networks. So there's a positive fact figure takeaway. Um, Michelle, you briefly introduced yourself. Very briefly, but let me Would give you like a little to... bit of context. Uh, again, my name is Michelle Coffey. I run Lambent Foundation. Lambent Foundation focuses on cultural arts organizations where artists are at the center. And we fund in New York, New Orleans, and Nairobi and believe in the intentional uh, African diasporic flow uh, happening between uh, those three locations. So, and I'm the director of the Trust for Mutual Understanding, and at TMU we support exchanges in the arts and the environment and the intersection thereof between the United States and 30 countries, encompassing, and I'll draw a little map with my hands, which might make no sense, but Central East, Southeast Europe, the Baltic States, Central Asia, the Caucasus, Mongolia, Russia. <laughs> That's where we work. Uh, so we have three esteemed panelists with us today, and I'm going to go down the line starting with Kim and let them briefly introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Kim Chan, and I am an arts worker and cultural organizer who has worked out of New mostly New York City and Washington, DC. Um, I have the great joy of having every single one of my jobs be at organizations where um, international cultural exchange is a, a value and a financial priority in the work that we do, even though it's really, really hard. 
and um, the, the, I completely endorse the findings of Americans for the Arts because that work has not only transformed my professional life, but also my personal life. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mabel Ellen Honey. As you can imagine, I'm not Sunny, um, who had a, um, I have a family emergency, so I'm stepping in um, to that role. Um, I am based in Chicago, I'm a curator, and I prefer the term arts worker as well. Um, I oversee a residency program at High Park Arts Center, an 80-year-old community-focused art space um, in Chicago, which has a studio arts program, um, an exhibitions program, and the residency that I oversee supports artists and curators, both Chicago-based and visitors, for deep dive research-focused residencies. Um, we also support and initiate exchanges with community-focused arts organizations across the country, like Project Warehouses and internationally. Thank you. Matthew. My name is Matthew Covey. I run an organization here in New York called Tommy's Got, uh, which is a nonprofit that works broadly in the field of what we have come to now call cultural and artist mobility. Um, we work, we've been around since the 90s doing research, legal research, advocacy, uh, and also working a lot of cases with our affiliated law firm. I'm also an immigration attorney. With our affiliated law firm, we handle visas for about 5,000 musicians and actors coming to the U.S. each year. Um, we work with the government when they work with us. We sue the government when they don't work with us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, we have a variety of other projects, artists residency programs for artists at risk, uh, a legal hotline for artists who run immigration problems, that kind of thing. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, we're just gonna start with Mega. Mega, do you mind telling us a bit about, I know you talked earlier about Hyde Park uh, Art Center and, and now just a tiny bit, but can you, sorry, this is, I need to put it closer. Um, could you talk to us about the inherent, uh, is international, it seems like it is, international cultural exchange in the DNA of Hyde Park Art Center and how does that impact how you work with artists? Um, what is that, how does that um, influence your work there? Uh, yes, absolutely, I can talk to that. Um, it, it, it's a great question. Um, it is in the DNA of the of program, certainly, but from a kind of in interesting perspective. The organization itself, Hyde Park Art Center, which I had a chance to talk a bit about with my, my guest, um, our, our residents on the bat. Um, the organization itself is very locally focused. It's, it's um, as I mentioned before, it was uh, supported and established exclusively by artists in 1939 um, in Hyde Park neighborhood in the south side of Chicago. And it's meant to be an incubator for artists um, at every stage or any stage of their career across the city. So the goal is really of this program and all of the programs of the organization is to enrich art making, enrich the dialogue for art practice across the city. Um, about 10 years ago, we moved into a permanent home after decades of being itinerant, um, which was a huge step. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that that move afforded was working space for artists for the very first time. So it was an exciting moment to think about what a residency program could be. Um, to support artists in that in-between stage. So no longer taking studio art classes, not an art school, um, but it's also not the finished, polished exhibition. It's about everything in between. And the residency is meant to be a very public-facing program where we also are activating and inviting our public and our audience into understanding a more holistic idea of art making. Mm -hmm. um, the creation, the problem solving, and then eventually the finishing of a work to be exhibited. So an essential piece of this is the invitation to visitors, visiting artists and curators into our hyper-local context um, to, of course, support their practice, but also, and very equally, to challenge our own thinking about art making and conceptual practices, um, and to think about what the social, political, and cultural questions are that underlie an artist's work. So um, a few questions that we do try to ask are, what can Chicago artists learn and share with a visiting artist and curator? You know, what does hosting look like in a deep way, thinking about mm -hmm. long-term relationships? Um, what are the commonalities across practice? And how, how are contemporary art practices tied to the specific culture and location where they are born? Um, and then what are the shared through lines that come across culture? So these are the kind of questions mm -hmm. that 
that really um, surround the work that we're doing. And there's been really great learnings from these exchanges that we are trying to actively use to evolve and transform the institution. And I'll just say that this, you know, this, the notion of mobility is um, really in opposition to sort of an idea of being a tourist. The organization is located very far from any tourist center. It's in a residential community um, where people are going to school and living and working. Um, and the goal of this type of mobility is really for as engaged and deep kind of um, exchange as possible to really enact learning and change both in Chicago and then outside of that. Great, thank you. Um, Kim, let's move to you. So uh, we're, we're talking about the importance of international cultural exchange right now, and Megha just gave us a, a good example of how Hyde Park Art Center uh, thinks about, about exchange. Um, but will you give us an example? I mean, you said in your introduction that this type of work has impacted you professionally and personally. So can you give us an example of a project that, that highlights the importance of what we're talking about with this type of cultural exchange? Uh, so I, is this, am I talking close enough to the mic? Um, okay, so I can tell a story because we are at Baruch College, which is also a part of the City University System of New York, and I think that one of the international cultural exchange um, themes throughout my career at many different organizations has been really focused on exchanges between the U.S., Mexico, and the mythical land that some call Atzlan, which may or may not have been a reality. So in my most recently, as the general manager for the Penn World Voices Festival of International Literature, I worked with a Mexican writer who's now based here in New York named Alvaro Enrique, and a cohort of undocumented students who are enrolled in the CUNY system here, several of them quite brilliant, quite inspiring Baruch students. And over the course of the past three or four years, we um, created a, really an extended family and um, a creative workshop where the students were able through writing to break through their isolation and to find um, peers who, where they were no longer afraid to share their stories. And through that project, just this past June, we actually published an anthology of the work that came out of this program. Um, my work working with Mexican artists dates back to like the, because I'm old, the, early, <laughs> the, um, the mid to late 80s and the Border Arts Workshop, when I, which was based, a, a multinational group of artists and activists based on the um, Tijuana-San Diego border. And I became um, very close a rela working relationship with one of those artists named Guillermo Gomez Pena and produced his Counter Quincentenary um, trilogy in Washington, D.C. One of the projects that I did with him, which I think connects back to my work with the Dreamers, is um, was called the Temple of Confessions, in which we brought in the conceptual artist from Mexico City, Cesar Martinez, and in the Temple of Confessions, there was a temple of fear and a temple of desire, and we solicited the um, audience through a phone, through a, a, a dial-in number, like 1-888, called Vato, and um, to confess their fears and desires about Mexicans, um, as well as also in the gallery. And then um, in, in, in the culminating event of this performance, Cesar created a life-size um, jello mold of a naked man who we served to the audience as the last immigrant and had an entire ritual surrounding the last immigrant and the fluctuating borders between the US and Mexico and Atzlan. And I think that, you know, that was 1996, but the deeper we get into the undocumented um, debates here in the US, the more and more I realize like I need Cesar back <laughs> and I need him to reimagine with us now 
or to just repeat the Jello Man all over again. Um, and in between, you know, another one of our projects along those lines in terms of engaging these issues on the centenary of the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty, which was the treaty in which um, I think it was a third of Mexican territory became part of the US. So imagine border issues when you go to sleep one night in one country and you wake up the next day in another. And so for that treaty, we did at the Smithsonian Museum of American History, a binational dialogue called the Guadalupe Hidalgo Dinner Party, where we um, had um, a philosopher, some uh, Guillermo, um, a, an immigration lawyer, talk while being served dinner by white people. Wow. So. Kim, I really <laughs> appreciate you taking us back to 1996. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those These might, issues are not new. They're no, not new. No. And I really, um, we all really appreciate everyone's voices um, that permitted this stage for today. Um, and my question that I ask myself is where did philanthropy go? Um, where have we been as funders to stand alongside such uh, fierce cultural producers? So thank you for the reminder of 1996. Oh. I think that's where we left off. And kind of want to talk about this declining or acknowledge the fact that there's been declining support for your work. There's been declining support for our work. Um, I also kind of want to acknowledge um, some little bit of uh, happiness that I have that finally U.S. philanthropy started to acknowledge criminal justice reform and gender inequity, reproductive rights, many of our justice issues that many of us have been fighting for for a very long time. That philanthropy somehow has uh, seen that sparkle and directed monies towards that. But in doing so, we've missed uh, the folks who've always been at the forefront and those be cultural producers. Uh, cultural activist, and in doing, in rec, in ignoring the cultural producers in this work, we have created um, harm um, and discord and disconnect, and that is one of the purposes of this conversation. This panel is to figure out what can we, uh, what are we seeing, uh, what can we do about it, um, what are we doing about it? Uh, but Barbara, can you, uh, you actually did, uh, TMU did amazing research, mainly because TMU has always been here, but could you show, share some of that data with us to reinforce that philanthropy disappeared? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just actually, I'll just share sort of two quick points. So some of you, some of you who are in the audience who are in philanthropy might remember, who are in arts philanthropy might remember this uh, publication titled Promoting Public and Private Reinvestment in Cultural Exchange-Based Diplomacy. I know Kim remembers it because <laughs> she saw it on the table and said, I remember that. And she said, we might need a new one uh, and agreed. So this is from 2010. Um, this, is, uh, this was commissioned by the then president at the time of Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, Peggy Ayers, who ran that foundation from 1979 to 2003. And it covers a time period from, or to 2013, excuse me. So this covers a time period from 2003 to 2008. And in this report, uh, there's a consistent reference to the top 10 funders of international cultural exchange in here. And so now in 2019, those top 10 funders that they talk about, six out of those 10 no longer fund in international cultural exchange, including the commissioner of the report, Robert Sterling Clark Foundation. Um, that's the first uh, a bit of update. But, and the second is that, and this is not to brag on the Trust for Mutual Understanding at all, but from the time period between 2009 to 2019, the Trust for Mutual Understanding is the top funder in international cultural exchange. And that, my friends, is pathetic because we are so small. Our budget is, you know, I mentioned we fund in the arts and the environment and the intersection thereof. So our total grant budget is usually around 2.5 million and around 1.5 or so of that goes to the arts every year. So that lets you know uh, how robust the, the top funder of international cultural exchange is. Um, so, 
Yeah, so that sort of paints the overall funding picture for you. Now we're gonna go over to our expert, Matthew, to tell us a little bit about what are some of the additional barriers um, to this work. I think the, what you said at the beginning about how the, the collapse in funding really corresponds, unfortunately, with the staggering increase in the costs and complexity of giving artists in the US. Um, very basic primer, I think probably most people here know this, but just to be on the safe side, when foreign artists come to the US, they almost always need some kind of visa to do that. Usually, if they're performing, they're gonna need an employment visa. Doesn't matter whether they're Iranian or Canadian, uh, the, the process is pretty much the same. Uh, getting one of these visas typically costs between $2,000 and $10,000. Doesn't matter if you're coming for a day or if you're coming for three years, it still doesn't cost that much money. Uh, getting artist work visas is a two-part process. The first part is handled by, uh, by U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Uh, once the process has gone through their purview, it moves on to the State Department. Their job is to figure out if you're famous and important enough to, get a, to, to deserve to come to America as an artist. Once they decide you are, it moves on to the State Department, which decides if you're a savory enough human being to allow you to come to the United States. Um, this has always been a hard process. Yeah. Um, you know, I started doing this in the early 90s uh, when the, these laws were fairly new and we thought it was terrible then. Um, we had no idea where it was going to go. <laughs> um, the, what we've seen mostly is that the, the, the first part of the process is really difficult and just kind of always keeps getting worse, but not a particularly politicized way too much. Uh, the second part of the process where artists go to the U.S. Embassy locally and apply for visas, this has collapsed in the last three years. Um, where, uh, <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous, but even artists from Western Europe are having a lot of trouble. Famous artists are having trouble, so you can imagine what that means for artists coming from the global south. Um, it doesn't matter if they're coming from the Lincoln Center or Kennedy Center. We're still seeing huge problems with these artists coming in. Um, there's a lot of legal issues around why that's happening and whether it's justified. There's also a lot of lawsuits about it. But the fact of the matter is, while we wait for the government to address these issues, um, most of the work that's being done is going to, law uh, to immigration lawyers. And that's had a huge effect on driving the cost up. Uh, the, in the last 25 year, years, the cost of bringing artists to the U.S. have increased 2,000%. Two thousand percent. Okay, that's including the cost of legal fees, union fees, filing fees. But on average, that's the cost. Um, in the last ten years, almost all U.S. presenters have been forced to hire legal counsel to help them. There's a few holdouts. They still do a great job by themselves without hiring lawyers. It's amazing. Keep at it. Uh, but again, when you bring lawyers in, obviously, as everyone knows, the costs go up massively. Um, in the last two, two years, the travel ban, extreme vetting, and general degradation of the administrative services and capacities of the U.S. State Department have contributed to a situation where all artist visa processes become less predictable and more arbitrary. Uh, the effect um, is that presenting foreign artists has become massively expensive uh, when it works and when it doesn't financially catastrophic. Uh, the situation is so bad that even renowned artists are not getting visas. Uh, if you're tuned into this, you'll notice in the entertainment uh, media, there's just tours getting canceled, exhibitions getting canceled. It's a really common process now. Um, and that has just created a situation where, uh, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit, how this the ripple effects that have been happening within, especially in the performing arts. But um, that's kind of an overview of where, where we stand right now. Mm -hmm. And then just to piggyback on that, um, just to give a couple examples of uh, what are some of the challenges, um, a couple a couple specific stories about these visa issues. Um, I'm going to use probably several times during this panel CEC Arts Link as an example uh, because they are one of our long-term grantees. This is also their assembly today. <laughs> so CEC has been a grantee of the Trust for Mutual Understanding since 1992. So example number one is CEC. Yeah, yay! <laughs> Right on. Um, so last summer, uh, CEC had a fellow from Lebanon who had been already been to the U.S. before in 2013, 
and they were funded to lead a project with the Cleveland Public Theater's new Arabic theater group. So this, um, this, this fellow was initially told by the US Embassy that the visa would be issued, no problem, but a week later she was asked to fill out a specific form that maybe many of you in the audience know. It's called DS5535, it's the extreme vetting form. Um, she submitted that and uh, her application then went into limbo. Um, finally, she re did receive her visa uh, two months later, but that was six weeks after the project had ended. Um, next example, last example from me is Kronos Quartet. So again, this past summer, um, the centerpiece of their annual festival was a commissioned work by Hawasa, Hawa, Hawa Kase Mehdi Diabate, our renowned Malian singer and griot. And Diabate had been to the U.S. many times before. So again, in both of these examples, this is not someone coming to the U.S. for the first time. These are people who have been here before. Um, again, her application, or uh, Diabate's application was delayed due to the extreme vetting procedures and uh, then uh, eventually was issued, but on the Monday after the scheduled performance. Move back to you, Matthew. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are horror stories, and we're telling horror stories in a way because we want, if you haven't clued into what's going on, we want you to clue into it. Mm -hmm. But we also don't want there's, there's a risk to telling horror stories. Right. The risk to telling horror stories is that it's very discouraging. And then these people do not want to try. Um, and this, is the, this has become one of the hugest problems that we're facing in working with US arts presenters and arts organizations, um, is that the result of the increased cost and unpredictability of these processes leading our presenters to be reluctant to even work with international artists. Um, I was having a conversation with Susan Feldman, from, who's the director of St. Anne's, and you probably know her. Uh, who brought the groundbreaking uh, play of the jungle uh, to, to New York last autumn. And she told me that the jungle was and continues to be a huge risk given the unpredictability of the visa barriers for the actors. In the end, last year, we got them all here after about 10 months of work, but only with the help of some very influential people and significant legal assistance. Not all the presenters have access to these resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I also spoke with Jack Walsh, again, somebody many of you might know, who uh, is one of the people who was the executive producer of Celebrate Brooklyn, and he said, as a U.S. presenter, I must think twice about attempting to bring a foreign artist. Ultimately, it always faces one disaster, and the arts programmers won't be able to convince their financial teams to approve working with an international artist. Um, so, then it just follows up the chain. If the presenters are, if the presenters are reluctant to, then the agents and the managers and people who work with artists are become reluctant to take on those artists. Um, I had a conversation with Mel Pulliats, who's one of the leading art uh, agents in the U.S. for a lot of artists from Africa, and he told me that in 2019 we dropped uh, these artists due to visa risks. Sheik Lowe, City Tori, Top National, Lakou Music, Trio de Calia. Every week we're solicited, solicited by artists and managers who are representing, uh, for representation every week we decline opportunities. In 2020, once their visas expire, we'll be dropping more. I didn't pursue a whole bunch of artists over the last few years because of the visa and tax rules. Last week I turned down a legendary Grammy nominated band from West Africa because I don't want to take on the visa risks. Uh, Mike Green, who is a Canadian talent art, sorry, talent agent, a member of the uh, Nakama big agency, uh, the big uh, managers association, said, This is the first one, I think. Things with international artists have gotten so complicated. Uh, that for the most part we have stopped representing artists from outside of the U.S. It's partially a matter of cost and the crazy amount of paper paperwork involved with everything from visa applications to CWAs, but it's also the difficulty of getting presenters to take a chance on artists with whom they are unfamiliar and who are unfamiliar to U.S. audiences. And this, of course, goes a step further, showing our culture's lack of curiosity and about anything unfamiliar and not part of the mainstream popular culture. Um, and then it goes up the chain again, and we start finding, and this is something we find a lot in our work, is artists internationally just aren't interested in coming to the U.S. anymore. Mm -hmm. um, this used, there was a time when the U.S. audiences and the U.S. markets were what, for, for better or for worse, a, a huge focus for a lot of the international arts in the That's really changing. Uh, I was speaking with Frederick Julian, who's the Director of Research and Development for the Canadian Arts Presenting Association, which is sort of Canada's APAP. He told me that Canadian art sector and public arts funders are attempting to 
diversify export avenues and develop reciprocal relationships with markets other than the United States. In short, we're looking for other friends. And about three weeks ago, I was in Brussels at the annual meeting of the European Music Export Organizations, and there was two basic things that the entire meeting was about, which is how do we develop audiences and markets for European artists, which are not the US and not the UK. So this fatigue <laughs> extends. <laughs> We're going to continue with some a few horror stories here. Um, but it extends to uh, the presenting community, and it extends to, you know, uh, just from our example, from, from, from our grantees who are bringing artists uh, from abroad. For example, I will use CEC Arts Link again as, as another example. So I mentioned that the Trust for Mutual Understanding has been funding CEC since 1992. And at that time, um, the Arts Link International Fellowships Program was a, a, a sort of triple threat funded by Trust for Mutual Understanding, Open Society Foundation at the time, um, and the NEA. And uh, unfortunately now, today in 2019, the Trust for Mutual Understanding is the only uh, funder still funding that program, um, the one that brought many of you remarkable people here um, here today. Um, and so because of that, uh, the, in 1992, there were 50 fellows that came. And in 2019, uh, the number's been reduced to 10. Um, and then Global Fest, Kim, do you want to give us a little Global Sure, Fest how many people here are familiar with Global Fest? Okay, so Global Fest is um, a world music festival that was founded here in New York City 17 years ago, and which really transformed the discussion between people who are already world music presenters and the rest of the presenting field, and really made a market for a type of music where we knew there was a market and an audience for it, but some of the less imaginative presenters or curious presenters maybe didn't know. And so with Global Fest, um, the producers were able to leverage that interest um, through a festival, but also through a professional development conference that happened at APAP and through a touring fund um, to sort of echo what Michelle was saying about how funding disappears. Um, when funders shift their priority, and it's not that funders should always have the same priorities and only fund the same organizations, but the vulnerability is such that here is a major international um, investment by sort of run in a started in a very DIY way, and um, the one of their largest funders, the Ford Foundation, adopted a new funding strategy and Global Fest was no longer one of their grantees and the festival nearly tanked. But they, you know, they did find a way to survive, but I think the sort of hand-to-mouth nature yeah. every year is um, something that presenters in the U.S. have a hard time escaping. Yeah. And it's, it's, so this is impacting presenters, this is impacting um, arts organizations in the US, but you know, I, I think, I mean, we're looking out at the audience and so many of you are artists um, coming in from outside of the United States. And so Kim, can you speak a little bit to how this impacts the artists themselves? Well, I mean, I think I would agree with, with Matthew that several of the artists that I know who maybe would have tried to come here previously won't. Mm -hmm. um, I had a meeting uh, just a few days ago with a, a, f a European funder who is interested in starting an ex and funding an exchange program with the US, but has heard such stories about the US that he's not sure he can convince his peers on his board. And I spent maybe 20 minutes going, let me introduce you to my network of, of fellow Americans who will fight tooth and nail to get this work done because we need you as an ally and you need them. I don't know if he believed me, and <laughs> I hope that network is still here. <laughs> so we've been sharing dark stories, um, not to silence or not to scare um you all know this yeah um we now have been able to share data so you're not crazy in thinking this 
Um, but what we also wanted to do was offer some recommendations. Um, we know uh, from colleagues and our own work that we're seeing new artist residencies starting up um, with very little monies. We see people trying to uh, individually do their own exchanges. And so um, I think let's open it up and offer some recommendations so that we can uh, feel a collective mm -hmm. again and not so isolated. Great. I'll start with a funder recommendation <laughs> from the funding side of things. Um, so recommendation number one from us is that grant makers need to commit to short and long-term increases in funding for international cultural projects and also commit to multi-year grants, as well as an increase in core support for organizations. So for example, <laughs> thanks, yeah, thank you. Um, so for example, from, from the Trust for Mutual Understanding's point of view, uh, we have been facing, we are right in the thick of this, right? We're right in the thick of this with, with all of our grantees. And so um, what, Russia is one of the countries that um, where we fund exchanges. So what's happening in Russia right now is uh, because of the situation between uh, Russia and the United States, it's very difficult to go to the US consulate and uh, have your visa interview. So the, the waiting times are incredible and they keep increasing and they're about a year now. It's about a year wait time. So uh, we immediately had grantees come to us and say, look, we can't wait a year. We're gonna have to postpone all of our projects. Um, so the workaround is that you can go, if, if you're traveling elsewhere, um, you can go to other cities and other countries to the US consulate there and have your, your visa interview. So uh, many grantees are going to Helsinki, they're going to Prague, um, they're going to Vienna, some are even going to Ulaanbaatar and Mongolia because that's easier. Um, that is, uh, means that we have to be more flexible on our end as far as time. Um, we have to be more flexible as far as um, the size of our grants and uh, if there are emergencies, being able to increase those grants. And then we also are really exploring uh, with long-term grantee partners, multi-year grant making, just so that it's easier for them to plan out these projects. Um, it's, it's making a huge difference, but it's an important thing to do. Let me follow up in philanthropy again Please. with a recommendation. And this is to offer um, you guys to see some of the work that we do inside of philanthropy. That's not just about grant making. And so one of the recommendations I would always say to uh, foundation colleagues is do not do this alone. You must work in collaboration. You must work in collaboration not only with your grantee partners, but with other foundations. Um, one, the money is so small, so how we have opportunities to leverage and increase the money. But more importantly, there's learning mm -hmm. and there's humbling that happens. Um, I can give an example of um, a few years ago, fun, U.S. funders used to think that it was so cheap to be able to fund in East Africa um, because the dollar went a long way. Funders, U.S. funders didn't realize that for folks to move along, move around three countries of Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, most likely you were flying back to the UK, to Amsterdam and France in order to come back uh, to um, Central Africa. And the costs were exorbitant. One of the things because of funders stepping away over the last 10 years was not recognizing the intense, let me go ahead and say neoliberal development that's happened in these places. Um, the airlines um, that have now are serving East Africa or Central Africa. So there's significantly fast and increased mobility among cultural workers and artists in East Africa, but the foundations are still working with a mindset that's 10 years old mm -hmm. and actually working with a mindset that continues to do harm. And so when foundations get to work together, learn together, uh, really learn together um, their ways of uh, improving the type of grant making strategies that are no longer doing as much harm. Yeah. Um, another suggestion I would say is for arts organizations and artists themselves to recognize that because there is funding in the U.S. to support cultural exchange, many of the artists who are coming to the U.S. are coming from countries that can afford to send their artists here. And those countries are the countries you'd expect can afford to spend mm -hmm. send artists here. And so the voices that we do hear in the U.S. from foreign artists tend to be the ones we've always heard. Nothing wrong with those people, nothing wrong with those voices, but it doesn't help the diversity of what we're hearing. So when you are doing projects in the U.S., and when you're, whether you're an artist or an arts organization or a funder, 
prioritizing working with artists who are coming from countries where those voices aren't heard. I, I, I was just in Chicago working with MacArthur Foundation on their Chicago Promise projects, um, where they select 10 or 12 small arts organizations in Chicago every year, and they set up literal cultural exchange. The arts organization in Chicago goes to Ghana the art, to work with another a theater in Ghana, and the Ghana, Ghanaian theater comes to Chicago. It's amazing, because these are, again, hyper-local situations where those artists are staying in people's homes, breaking bread, making art together, and the kind of effect that those have on these hyper-local communities, often fairly isolated communities, um, is, is, is staggering. And that's because in this situation, MacArthur has the, the wherewithal to see how important that is. It's a program that should every city in the United States should have. Uh, unfortunately, there's only that to do that. Um, another recommendation, which is yours, Michelle. I actually like that underscore that point from the perspective of the arts organization that we, I, I would like to acknowledge that while it has become increasingly difficult for anyone from outside the U.S. to travel to the U.S., um, it continues to be extra difficult and, and um, with exorbitant barriers for many, um, most of the world really, non-European, less desirable countries. Um, so the impact of that, to your point, Matthew, is that um, you know um, countries that have consulates and supportive cultural bodies are able to more effectively export their culture, and American organizations and institutions are incentivized to work with those countries. And while it's very difficult, uh, the arts organizations have, I mean, I'd like to think that there is recourse, and we have to, for the well-being of our programs, continue to see the value of supporting the artists that we want to bring to our cities and to expose to our art communities. So, you know, a few ways that we can think about this is, I do think it's important for arts organizations to know that they do have a voice with funders mm -hmm. and that they can lobby um, and begin the conversation about projects they want to do. Um, I think one way to go about this is, um, is, is thinking about a visiting artist's trip to the U.S. Can that be capitalized upon in a way? Can it be a two-part residency, let's say, with a stop in Chicago and a meaningful stop in another city? Um, so this isn't promoting the idea of kind of hopping among residencies, mm -hmm. but really having a thoughtful, intentional itinerary for an artist um, to make the most of that, the expense of that travel and that, that journey. Mm -hmm. And that's something that arts organizations can work together to strictly strategize. Um, there are a couple of, at least in the residency um, kind of field, a few sector organizations, the Alliance for Artists Communities, um, Res Artists, among others, where we're hoping to work with those organizations to help them facilitate the connection among residency programs to even explore these conversations. Um, and then the other side, too, is the value of the cross-cultural exchange program. Uh, U.S. artists traveling abroad and then welcoming someone to the U.S. This is that same sort of network building, but among programs and organizations that are based internationally. And I think that's something that the funders can also support that network building. So I think there's a lot of possibilities here of how we can sort of leverage the resources we have and to maximize on how difficult it is to um, to support an artist to come to the U.S., but to still ensure that we prioritize it and, and work together to make it happen. That's such a good example, and thank you for bringing it up. And I, I think it, it underscores the need for collaboration, the need for collective action, the fact that I'm going to use the buzzword of silo, but you know we're all in our whether that's an institutional silo or whether that's a, um, a you know a silo of programmatic focus or, or what what have you. But um, it's not only arts organizations working together and funders um, taking the initiative to, to fund that collaboration, but it's also funders can work together too, <laughs> and uh, there's. There's an example of this um, that I just wanted to bring up on the in, on the environmental funding side. Um, a couple years ago, there was something called the Environmental Defenders Fund that was created, and it's uh, roughly about ten um, larger foundations that have come together, and it's an emergency fund essentially for frontline environmental defenders who are at risk. So, so it is possible to do from the funding side as, as well. So, yeah. So. Um, 
I, uh, my recommendation is to the funders and to the arts workers out there that um, the funding that has existed has been phenomenal, although it's been sort of cyclical in that it's really focused on very pragmatic things like travel, per diem, visas, mm -hmm. production, residency support. But I think that one of the reasons here in the US some of the um, overall commitment institutionally to international cultural exchange has happens in fits and starts is because some of the core support or maybe also some of the advocacy about the value of this kind of work needs to go directly to the boards of directors of the nonprofits and the heads of the university administrations and the headhunters because what happens is there's you know turnover in the field and so you have the same core group of people committed to international cultural exchange moving from job to job, but the people who then hire those individuals replacements may not necessarily have that same level of commitment and won't know how to advocate with the board or the university administration to do this. And so I think we really need to also look at if there's going to be more core support to tie the core support to systemic change. Mm -hmm. Because even though like I understand and advocate for the value of GOS, if GOS is only going to let people repeat this cycle that I think I know there is enough creativity in the field to break out of, yeah. then we really need to band together and go one level deeper. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, just for the sake of time, we're, we're looking at, uh, it's, it's, it's five o'clock right now, so we, we will open up for, we're going to go over just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit, not too much, but just wanted to give you the opportunity, if there are any questions um, for any of the panelists up here, we are happy to quickly field any of those, mm -hmm. if anybody has one. Raise your hand high if you do. And when you raise your hand, a microphone is going to come to you uh, because HowlRound is recording this. So please wait till the microphone uh, all the way in the middle. I think it's, is it Elizabeth? Ah, hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> like to see changed, uh, the systems you'd like to see changed, um, what would that look like to you? What's that, what's your vision for that? And this is directed to Kim, so to piggyback on your last um, question. So what I'd like to see are boards of directors and people in governance positions um, and the, you know, the marketing staff the education staff, the finance staff, all with the same passionate commitment to international cultural exchange as I, as I hear from the people on the producing and curatorial front. Um, I think that, and I think some of this is just really tied to turnover in the field that often people get jobs in presenting where, um, you know, they've come from somewhere else, they have a different mindset. And I know that when I was at Arts Presenters on the board and also on the staff, we had different programs where we tried to coach um, newcomers and people who are unfamiliar with some of these issues into the community, but I think um, it, that wasn't enough, you know, because we as a service organization were there, you know, two or three times a year interacting with our constituents. And what we need are the daily reinforcements at that hyper local level. Mm -hmm. And um, you, because I think audiences sometimes understand this more than the people who are making the financial decisions about how to spend the money. Um, and the example that I have to share of that is when I, we, when I was in DC and we were working on the first US tour of Los Monuquitos from Cuba, people were walking up to us on the street, like we weren't even going to a rehearsal or to a show, and they had like made food 
and brought and were just giving it to us. They were like seeking us out wow. and thanking us and asking how could they be um, a deeper part of their of their community and letting us know that they had a strong affinity for Cuba because perhaps they were Cuban, but they had always been afraid to let people in DC know that because they thought it would be looked down upon because DC is a, a very mainstream culture that's sort of dominated by the US black white, mm -hmm. and they were afraid to bring up the Cuban. Mm -hmm. And so this empowered them. Yeah. Um, also, to answer your question about systemic change, kind of from a different angle, um, from running a small arts nonprofit, I feel, but also uh, in, in the legal field, I often feel like the silos in the performing arts and in the art sector in general, which separate the way that funders think from the way that artists think, from the way that presenters or the arts support organizations think really keep us from collaborating in ways that it's not productive. Um, about a year ago, the IRS created a new rule, which many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, which made it no longer possible for artists, or independent artists who don't make a ton of money in the US to manage their uh, their tax withholding. And so they were going to stop paying 30% tax withholding on everything they made in the US. It was the first time uh, that happened for years. There was a, there was a thing called the Central Withholding Agreement that was a way that artists could manage that. Um, we were appalled by it, but didn't know anything about accounting, um, and didn't know, didn't know anything about lobbying either. And but called an accounting firm that we worked with before. I said, "What can we do about this?" And called uh, Mike Orlock, everybody's best friend. I said, okay. uh, I said, Mike, can you get us in a meeting with the IRS? And he was like, sure, I can get that. And then working with the lobbyist, uh, Heather Newman from the American Orchestras, we put together a team of people who had the pieces necessary to be able to write a proposal, to take it to the IRS. And the IRS, the IRS said, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> all of our heads are so they know the IRS did things like that. But a year later, it's more or less solved. But this was only because there were creative people who were willing to work across the silos. And I mean, in this case, we all just knew each other, so it made sense. But if we didn't already know each other, I don't know that we would have known to have done that. But I think that kind of collaboration mm -hmm. is the kind of thing that's needed in our sector. We're not a very powerful sector. We're not, you know, aeronautics. We're not the military. We, we don't have that, that kind of power. And so we need to be able to work across sectors and bring our expertise to one another in order to make sense. There are oh, yeah, yeah. three. Megan wanted to say. I'm just going to say, in a simple, okay, from the fundamental structural change, would be that arts organizations and funders really explore what partnerships looks like, um, where the grantees are considered true partners. And for example, and there's many foundations that do that and think that way, but like, you don't drop a grantee after years of funding. You know, because guidelines have changed, for example, mm -hmm. but that there's a dialogue there and sort of a good faith and trust in the relationship that's been built over time. And sort of, what's the nature of that um, of that partnership, and can we sort of resist the hierarchical, you know, funder, person with the money, and the people who are asking for it into something that is more collaborative? Yeah, we have three hands up. The best, best. And Matthew, this is a, mostly a question for you, building on what you just talked about uh, in a, as a way of sort of building a de facto lobbying. I mean, you went to the IRS, but um, is, is it possible for those of us that are working in international arts in the U.S. to uh, form a, a similar coalition around the problems that you presented around bringing artists in, or does that already exist and I'm just not aware of it? In regards, in regards to um, immigration issues specifically, uh, there is an ad hoc coalition of a bunch of, our, bunch of arts organizations um, that does, does lobbying work. Obviously, it's a huge problem right now, and the topic of immigration in the U.S. is such a <laughs> Brought one that you know you go to Washington, you go to the Hill, and you say, "Let's talk about immigration." But I only mean artists, like you know, that, <laughs> it doesn't doesn't carry a lot of weight. Um, but there is a lot of work being done. There's a lot. Uh, so yes, it exists. Uh, the Performing Artists Visa Working Group. It includes APAP. It includes the unions, uh, musicians' union, the 
um, the SAG, uh, the crew union. So these are part of it. Um, Folk Alliance is a member of it. I'm forgetting a bunch. Obviously, uh, you know, there's loads of arts organizations that are part of this. It's not enormously active, and it doesn't. It isn't enormously resourced, and it, it is just. There's no office. It's just they get together and uh, support each other's initiatives. There could be a lot more done collectively. Uh, on that. Yeah. So yes, there is a there is an organization that needs to be stronger and needs more participation to make it more effective. Matthew, do you mind if I no. poke a little bit? No, go for it. Uh, linking back to Elizabeth's question, though, around systemic change, that yes, it's important to go to Hill and advocate for ourselves, but we also need to be advocating for immigration. And so the idea of intersectionality between our issues, um, we are all aligned, we are all related in this. And so how do we recognize that, yes, we are support here to advocate for artists and cultural workers, but we also are here to advocate for undocumented workers um, and dreamers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as soon as we start collectively seeing um, our alignment with justice issues, yeah. that would also be about systemic change. Yeah, I agree yes. Um, I conceptually completely agree with you. I also know that I feel like there are so many problems and they're so huge. I feel like this this kind of, if, if I had a huge foundation right now and I was looking and said, okay, do I worry about mass incarceration? Do I worry about the opioid epidemic? Or do I worry about the arts? I think it's hard to look at that and say, and, and to not have that sort of major reaction, just like, you know what, we'll deal with the arts later, but we're gonna deal with the opioid epidemic first. I think that's really hard and it takes, it takes a really, it takes, a kind of articulation of the role that the arts play in our society and why it's important and why, you know, what is the connection between the opioid epidemic and the defunding of the arts and the collapse of right. education support? Right. These things are all tied together. Right. And that's the story that we need to get better at telling mm -hmm. those words. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we do that work. We do it daily. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, there were more hands up. <laughs> I jumped the queue. Yes. Apologies. Um, I have two questions. The first is that I really don't understand why the interest inter in international cultural cooperation has been on the decline for 10 years. I would have thought that it would happen under the present administration due to the political. Uh, so for me, as a Palestinian or a cultural working uh, worker working from outside, it's a bit shocking to know that the process had started. Uh, even before, so mm -hmm. it, 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 I find it really interesting to know why and what uh, motivated such a uh, lack of interest in international cooperation, the first question, the, this is the first uh, question. The second, uh, perhaps also, because we also have a problem with foundations, we don't have many foundations supporting the arts in the Arab world, but we do struggle with their governance, whether they have fair governance or not. Who makes the decision? Yes, it's philanthropy money. It's individuals' money. But at the end of the day, how can we make them more accountable? Uh, this is an issue that we struggle with. And I think if we bring this to the discussion of who sets the priorities and how can we push, and I think now I'm dreaming a bit, but how can we work towards a better governance model mm -hmm. where priorities are set in relationship to the needs on ground and not some millionaire's <laughs> fantasy and uh, and I'm here speaking from my projecting on my own experience working with funders in the Arab region mm -hmm. um, the other comment is about making bigger coalitions in Palestine as because the art sector is very uh, fragile and is very small and it's a bit closed um, on itself the only case we where we succeeded, succeeded to make change is when we opened up to other sectors human rights organizations, women's organizations. Um, and we had a big campaign when uh, investors uh, in the lack of uh, legal framework to protect old buildings were in, uh, with the support of municipalities and the government, demolishing old houses that should be protected. And for years, we couldn't do anything as artists and art operators. But when we opened up to human rights organizations, women's organizations, all civil society organizations, we could stop and call for the law. So maybe as art organizations, we also have to be a bit more open mm -hmm. 
to other sectors in order to impact, to make a better law. Yeah, absolutely. I can postulate. Do you want me to try to have a conjecture and then you tell me if you think, I don't know. So, um, I, well, you think it's education? That's that's why the funding has. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good point. I also think it harkens back to what Matthew just said a couple minutes ago about you know you you have these um, issues of urgency or or um, there are so many issues of urgency. Um, you know, mass incarceration, yes. Um, uh, opioid ep epidemic, yes. So, um, and and I'm going to speak respectfully about uh, about about foundations and, and funders, but I do think there is a propensity to um, uh, self determine what the urgency is and chase the thing that is you know seems to be the the um, uh, trend uh, of the time um, to the exclusion of other things and the the arts. Um, I don't necessarily think is valued as far as its sense of urgency, and I don't think there's proper valuing of its role in society. Uh, I also think, you know, what we're talking about is a double whammy of the art, funding for the arts, but then also funding for international cultural exchange. And when the house is on fire at home, everybody's gonna look inward, everybody's gonna look at home. So they're in the United States right now, uh, there, are, there are so many issues of urgency and emergency, and you have foundations really looking domestically and turning away from uh, working internationally and not really understanding the value of it. So um, there are those of us that are very loud and obnoxious <laughs> trying to advocate, but it, it seems to me that it's a, it's it's a lack of understanding of the importance of the arts. It's a, a, a responding, you know, emergency-wise to what's happening domestically, um, and it's a and it's very much about us trying to form these coalitions of advocacy and, and working together. Does that? I think so. And I would just add that philanthropy is slow. It's yeah. Late. It's late. Super slow. And so when something happens. It takes three to five years to get to it, and something else pops up, and so it's been, uh, it's distracting. Um, it's not responsive because it's not in direct conversation with communities, mm -hmm. um, and it thinks that it can actually solve it alone, yeah. and that will never happen. I also think there's a this met, uh, the idea of metrics and the focus on metrics. Um, so a lot of uh, foundations are really focused on what is the impact, how do you assess the impact, how do you measure the impact. And, and you know, I always, I find myself um, at, at funder convenings talking about how we as a foundation, um, we believe that metrics are possible, and we know that, um, that that they are important to many foundations, but for us, really, it's about the process, and it's about the depth of the exchange. So um, so it's it's about the relationships that are built over time, and, and how do you measure that? That's a really hard and tangible thing to measure. So a lot of times, I'll have uh, representatives of foundations say to me, well, then what you do is entirely anecdotal, and what you fund is entirely anecdotal. And I say, yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> It's true, but story is important and process is important. So maybe that has something to do with it too. I think also your question speaks to the inherent interdisciplinarity and of how artists approach problems. And I think if anything, this assembly really beautifully speaks to how tied questions of human rights and social justice mm -hmm. and social practice and contemporary art and conceptual practice um, are so interwoven and intertwined. Um, and so even that separation of the arts from issues and problems is a totally arbitrary yes. kind of false dichotomy that, that we need to together collectively kind of advocate for dismantling because fundamentally those disciplinary, I think some divisions are also, you know, very Eurocentric vestiges, white supremacies mm -hmm. as well. So that's also part of this work is to expand the idea, the sort of commonplace idea of what art can do and what artists are working on, which are huge problems, mm -hmm. um, and kind of move it out of this, this sort of um, the, uh, the niche world that it sometimes mm -hmm. operates within. Yeah. We have time for one more. One more. One more question. Who wants to be the last person? Just to one? Did you still want? Yeah. Okay. Here it comes. 
Thank you. Um, I, one question, actually, or more like commentary, comes from my recent experience. I spent a month in New Orleans, and that's a very unique place. And, um, okay, I have two things, actually, to say. One is um, how you would comment on also the raising criticism towards the funding that comes from what we call toxic funding, actually. Like, for example, there I encountered uh, raising criticism towards the oil uh, funding, like Hellis Foundation, for example. Another thing is, um, and I, I, I'm completely like supportive towards the exchange, and this is what I do as well. You know, coming here, I immediately thought of uh, how I can uh, activate my network and create certain type of exchange between the U.S. and the Baltics. But obviously, that's kind of difficult. Uh, and um, and I met around like 40 artists in New Orleans, which was quite a lot actually during this short time. And what I encountered is that actually artists are very eager to be exposed to experiences in Europe or like through residencies and different exchange programs and something, but actually they they don't know so much, like they don't know what is actually possible. They, they lack certain type of exposure to, to, to information. And I think that is also accessible through, you know, curators and, and education is one, one, one thing that was mentioned. And I think this is kind of an education, it's not just like general education, but also what kind of education exists within the cultural field and art field in, in, in particular. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Shall we? Shall we? Okay. okay. <laughs> We're, we are toxic. You want to talk about toxic funding? Okay. That's a tough, that's a toughie. I can try it. Please. Okay. Please, please, please. Only because of New Orleans. Uh, yeah, is, right? Is, um, a, a commitment of, a, a committed landscape of ours. And it's, it's complicated. Um, Hellas Foundation is a colleague, um, and it's an intentional colleague. Uh, specifically because it's a funder that's based in New Orleans and it's not sitting here in New York. And so I offer that because it is full of contradictions. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about that n the most northern Caribbean city. You know, New, uh, New Orleans identifies its I identity around the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution, not this country, not the United States in a way. Um, I also want to say fossil fuel, all money, is complicated and we should actually be questioning and investigating all of it. I appreciate Antenna, uh, which is the organization in New Orleans that runs the Fossil Free Fest. Um, the other thing that I speak with Bob Snead about, who runs Antenna, is that the fossil fuel industry are the employers of black and brown families for generations. And so there's a way to re resist it, but let's also look at the complications and lies that are intertwined in it. Um, so I'm one who encourages the, the excavation of the complexity around race, class, and privilege in New Orleans is the most magical site to do that in. Um, I think, it, and there will not be a, a simple answer to that. Um, Hellis Foundation or any fossil fuel money, uh, funding, is, you, we, we can say no to it. And we should start saying no to some of it. Um. Yeah, I mean, just one additional thought on that is that we, so we have a lot of obviously environmental grant, grantees doing environmental conservation work um, in parts of the world where um, there is a lot of intrusion by the extractive industries. And we do have several grantee organizations that, for example, work with mining companies and take money from mining companies. Um, and, and that's an internal decision on their part. Um, it's a values oriented decision. It's a, you know, um, can we encourage these companies to use better practices? Um, can we encourage remediation? Mediation? Can we advocate for local communities that are impacted? Um, so I think it's a very individual, um, values-based decision and, com and complicated and a really good question. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, this has been, this whole day has been amazing. Um, just thank you, I mean the, yeah.
the bravery and integrity and honesty and openness and um, care and your depth of sharing today has been really, really beautiful. Um, and, you know, I just, I feel grateful to have been a witness, to go back to what, what Amy started with, um, for us to witness and listen to each other and, and learn from each other. That has, this today has been such a, a, a wonderful day um, for that. Um, so to close, let's remember Amanda's statement, the small scale seizures of power. Yes. We need to do those. Yes. Yes. Um, we are, so this panel is the third of four panels. So the previous ones happened at Grantmakers in the Arts and Alliance of Artists Communities Conference. Today is, is uh, panel number three. The fourth one's happening during APAP on January 12th. Um, so please keep an eye out for that and attend. We'd love to have you. Um, and just thank you to CEC Arts Link. Um, thank you to uh, Boo Frable from Tommy Stott, um, Matthew's colleague, um, they both, and, and Simon. Um, it's just uh, this panel wouldn't have happened without these thought partners. So thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Mega, for stepping up at the last minute. You're amazing. Thank you, Matthew, for your expertise. Thank you very much.